So now I've started talking about quantum electrodynamics, <coughs> sort of been edging up to the subject of quantum mechanics. So let me try to give you an idea of quantum mechanics and to give you an idea of how successful I'll be. Quantum mechanics is one of those things that when I first learned it, I rebelled against it and didn't like it. It took me about 40 years to get used to it or something. And uh, finally, I'm beginning to think it's, it's okay and it's really the right thing to do. Einstein never liked it. But the surprising thing about quantum mechanics are things like this. If you shine a beam of light on two slits, so that the waves then come out from the slits in these spherical, supposed to be spherical bands. What you find out if you put a screen over here is that you have light, light, and dark areas, depending on how the waves arrive at this point, whether the waves are adding up or, or canceling one another. So you get what looks like a diffraction pattern. And this shouldn't surprise any of you too much. This, this happens, you may not have seen it. And with light, we all used to think of light as waves and so on. And uh, so it works. Now suppose we replace this light beam with a beam of electrons. What quantum mechanics has told us is that there's a wavelength associated with all matter, including electrons, that's given by this fundamental constant of nature divided by the momentum. So if you want to change the wavelength, you change the momentum, since uh, we're not allowed to change the fundamental constants. So if you shine the electrons on these two slits, what do you expect to happen? Well, it turns out, not surprisingly, that the same thing happens. You get a diffraction pattern here. So these electrons that we think of as particles are really behaving like waves and showing up as this pattern. So then you ask, well, we can put a stop to that. Suppose we just let one electron at a time go through there. Then it cannot interfere with anything. And uh, we shine a very low intensity electron beam on the screen. And one electron hits here every hour. And when we add it all up in the end, what do we see? The wave. To our consternation, we get this pattern. And the only way you can imagine getting this pattern, well, there may be other ways, but one way you can imagine it is if the, the electron somehow went through both holes at once. So it interfered with itself. So it ended up making this pattern. So then you say, well, I don't like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow these electrons one at a time and make sure I know which hole they went through and see that they didn't go through the other hole at the same time. So you put a little detector here that uh, tries to, goes off when an electron passes by, so you know it went through that hole. If it doesn't go through this hole, you know it went through that hole. So you can keep track of where every electron goes. When you do this, what do you get? Well, again, to your consternation, you find out that this diffraction pattern has disappeared. So checking up on the electron makes it behave. You know, it's sort of like, when your mother checks up on you for cleaning your room or something, and it's real, real stern with you, then you behave right. But when the electrons are not checked on, they make the diffraction pattern. This is quantum mechanics. It makes you very angry. <laughs> so people thought about this a lot and tried to understand how this could be. And it forced people to come up with the notion of wave functions to describe particles, which are basically waves. And the fact, the uncertainty principle plays a role here. I don't have to explain to you, but it turns out you can only measure uh, a particle's momentum and position to a certain accuracy at any one time. And it turns out if you, if you uh, put your detector here, you violate that principle, and you change the outcome of the experiment. So this is sort of a fascinating thing, and it takes a long time to get used to. But the bottom line there, for what I'm going to tell you, is that every particle in the universe, every bit of mass, has this wave function associated with it, so it behaves like a wave. So what do we do here at Fermilab? We're trying to learn, just like Rutherford did, what the protons now are made up of, what's deep down inside. We're trying to get to the heart of the problem. 
And so we're going to shine a beam of light onto some object. And suppose there are things inside of it that we want to learn something about. Imagine this is a proton, and we want to learn about the internal structure. And so we want to do Rutherford's experiment where we send things and see if we get this situation. Things bounce off hard scattering. And we have to keep this in mind, quantum mechanics, that our wavelength uh, goes like h Planck's constant over momentum. So if you shine a long wavelength light on here, where long is long compared to the size of this object, I think intuitively you can see, and I'm just trying to give you an intuitive feel now, that what will happen here is that this wave will interact with this whole object, may move it somewhere, but you're not going to learn a lot about what goes on in there. If on the other hand, you change this wavelength of your beam so that you're looking at a very short wavelength object, then you see you have a chance of interacting with just one of the constituents, whatever they are, and you learn something about what's in there. So now it's time to go back to our our experiment on how we see things and see what that means in terms of trying to see inside of a proton. So as you recall, we started out with an object hidden inside a box, shined a flashlight, and by some miracle we see that there's a soccer ball in there. What we're going to do here at Fermilab is we're going to make a target made out of protons, whatever, some substance, and we want to see deep inside not only the nucleus, but the protons in there. And we know now that this wavelength of our flashlight is probably too long to see the details that we want. So we replace our Buck 385 flashlight with an accelerator that costs, you know, the order of a billion dollars. <laughs> the government doesn't like to hear that. <laughs> we shine our beam on the target, and what happens is exactly the same thing. Particles scatter out in all directions. We pick up some of them in a detector that we have set off to the side. This is the way we used to do our research here. A fixed target, the beam from the accelerator. That detector uh, gathers information about these particles that are coming into it, and it's transmitted into a computer. Your computer, the computer does a complicated analysis, and you know what's in there. Now that doesn't sound like this so much because you're used to seeing things, but this is not just an analogy. This is exactly what we do and, and what happens here at the lab. What we've learned to do that makes this a little bit more confusing is because we want this wavelength, which I'll write down here again, to be as small as possible. And we're always learning new tricks. So some time ago we learned that if we took our target and got it moving in the accelerator in the other direction, so we take our one beam going this way and the other beam going the other way and collide them, then we effectively make this wavelength even much smaller. So that's the way our collider works. We put protons into the big tevatron going in one direction. We put antiprotons or antimatter, which we haven't talked about yet, I'll talk about it again, going the other direction, and we collide them, and we can see deep within the protons so that we think we know what's going on in there, and I'll explain what we think we see in a minute.